Sophia's War by Abby Chapter 5 After we had worked, cleaning and scrubbing, and putting such furniture as remained back in place, Mother stood in the center of the almost empty common room. Her face was tense, her eyes closed. I could see her suffering. I'm sorry, she said, to have been cross. It's difficult to know what to say or do. Could we send a message to Father, that he needs to hurry? Impossible. Is there any place we could search for William? I don't know where except that new prison. Then we should go, I urged. Mother found a pin and attached the red ribbon to her sleeve. Hopefully, she said, this will protect us. Latching the door, we set out along Broadway toward the Commons, some eight or nine streets north. The nearer we approached, the more British troops we saw. I have learned that heart and eyes are one. That's to say, one can see a thing, but when one is linked to it, the seeing is different. I had observed the new prison before. This time, as I drew closer, aware that my brother could be a prisoner, I now grasped how formidable a fortress it was. It had two stories of brick, some fifteen windows across, all with visible bars. The center section was three stories high. Chimneys stood at either end, plus four in the middle. Before the entryway stood a troop of redcoats on guard. A fence was all about. We stood and studied it. Come, Mother said at last. We moved toward the entryway and stopped in front of the soldiers. Please, sir, Mother said to an officer who seemed to be in charge. Can I find out if my son is in the prison? A rebel? He joined General Washington's army. You can apply for information at the city hall. But move on, madam. We retreated. Struggling not to cry, I waited for Mother to decide what to do next. At length, she said, we'd best find some food. Turning south and east, not talking, me gripping her arm, we went along narrow maiden lane toward the fly market where we usually did our marketing. The market was by the East River docks near the Long Island Ferry. When we met a few friends, news was exchanged in hushed and uneasy tones. Mother spoke of the hanging we had witnessed. That's how we learned the young man's name. In addition, we were told how the American soldiers, having retreated through Manhattan, had continued their withdrawal. Though almost cut off by the English, most, so we were informed, happily reached security. The American troops did strike back with some small success, but our forces were obliged to retreat farther. The only Patriot soldiers remaining on Manhattan Island were at the far north end, in Fort Washington. Whereas New York's population had been some 20,000, hardly more than 5,000 civilians remained. "'We are at the mercy of the British,' a friend of my mother's confided. Another said, "'It's the end of Patriot dreams.' Though I refused to believe that, it was not for me, a girl, to dispute such thoughts. When we reached the fly market, it was startling to see what had happened. Beneath the long, open shed, many stalls had been abandoned or destroyed. Remaining vendors had little to offer. The shortages were because the ferries, which normally brought food from Long Island and Jersey, had been curtailed. Accordingly, costs were shockingly high. We were lucky to get an old cabbage, a three-pound loaf of stale bread, and some Indian corn for fourteen pence. We hurried home. When we got there, I was relieved that the British officer had not arrived. However, neither had father. Or William. After I drew water from the street pump on Broadway, Mother cooked the cabbage in the hearth, using the one pot that had not been stolen. For firewood, we used pieces of broken chairs. To light the fire, I had to go two houses down to Mr. Portus's house, and beg a glowing ember from a frightened servant. The fire lit, the pages of common sense withered like dead flowers. By the time we had eaten and tidied as best we could, it was dark. Our inside shutters were closed. Father still had not returned. No word of William. As Mother and I sat in the tense and murky stillness, I heard the tramp of feet on the street. I leaped up, cracked open a shutter, and peeked out. A troop of British soldiers was marching down the way. As they passed, I heard the shouted command, All citizens shall remain in their homes during curfew on pain of severe punishment. It was repeated even fainter as the crier passed along. I crept back to Mother. The same fears I had before, about Father, William, the war, filled my mind and heart. Both were heavy. 
We did not speak, just held hands. In time, she said, Best to bed. As she banked the fire, I latched the front door. We bedded in my parents' room on the second floor. As we lay down, fully clothed, I was aware that we were sleeping there for the last time. I slept by her side, not on the low trundle where I usually reposed. I could not rest. My worrying was too intense. I kept trying to rid myself, too, of images of that hanging. Oh, the pity I felt for that young man. The cruelty. I could not deny the fear and hatred I had of the British soldiers. The cruelty. I could not deny the fear and hatred I had of the British soldiers. Which comes first, I asked myself, fear or hatred? By the moonlight that seeped through our one small window, I wondered what trials would be ours on the morrow. Accordingly, I prayed hard, not only for father's and for William's safety, but that our cause would not falter, and that I might find courage for myself. Though not sure it would be bestowed, I knew I would need it. Indeed, I did need it, and very soon. Chapter 6 Daylight came after but a poor night's sleep. I worked first with Mother cleaning the upstairs room, and then we turned Father's office into a bedroom for the three of us. It was good to be busy, for it distracted me from dismal thoughts of Father and William. Yet as hours passed, with no word from either, my concerns only multiplied. Mother gave permission for me to go to the nearby homes of two dear friends, Pamela Jones and Constance Wright. I found their houses boarded, doors marked G.R. or George Rex. Such a mark meant the British Army considered the occupants rebels and that they were taking possession of the house. I had no idea where my friends were. Indeed, I never saw them again. When night came, I told myself that Father and William would, must, be home next day. At least the house was in readiness. That night, as we went to bed in the new room, I listened to the watch going by. All citizens shall remain in their homes during curfew on pain of severe punishment. Huddled beneath the blanket, I began to wish Father would not come until the morning. After a while, there were no further sounds, not even the normal tread of the city's black slaves carrying night soil to the river. With that thought, I drifted into sleep. In the middle of the night, a sound woke me. I sat up but saw nothing save a blade of pale golden moonlight sliding through a gap in the window shutter. Uncertain if I had really heard anything, I listened hard. A creaking, perhaps a swinging sign the bang of what I hoped was a shudder, the soft moan of wind which my brain work told me was the despondent soul of Captain Hale. Perhaps he knew of my pity and had come in search of comfort. Shivering, I sank beneath the blanket and edged closer to Mother, only to hear the noise come again. That time I was sure it was tapping. When it came yet again, I became convinced it was upon our front door. Mother? She stirred. What? I think someone's at our door. She pushed herself up. We both listened. The tapping came again. I squeezed her arm. Do you think it's that officer? Are they about to take our house? Stay, she said, then slipped out of bed, wrapped her robe about, and went into the common room. I crept after her and watched as she pressed against the door. Who is it? she called. It's me, I heard. Father's voice. Mother pulled the door open, and there was Father. My heart rejoiced, but then he staggered forward, and in the feeble light I saw how gaunt and ill he appeared. His clothing was torn and in places blood spattered. In haste, Mother shut and latched the door behind him. Swinging about, she tried to embrace him. He winced and moved away, panting so. He could not speak. He was holding his right arm in an awkward position. "'Mr. Calderwood!' cried Mother. "'What's happened?' "'As I was coming through the lines.' he stammered. I was shot, struck in the arm. But I am overjoyed to see you, Miss Seville. Molly Seville was Mother's maiden name, and Father would, in moments of affection, call her Miss Seville. Mother guided him to the settle. Using an ember from the hearth, she lit a candle. Wide-eyed, I stood by as she stripped off his torn and bloody shirt. He recoiled in pain. When I saw a jagged wound in the upper part of his right arm, I shrank back. He said, any news of William? When Mother said, Nothing. He closed his eyes. Fetch some water, Mother called to me. I grabbed a pot and candle and, heedless of the night watch, dashed out to the street pump. 
When I got back, the fire was ablaze. As mother heated the water, father told us haltingly what had happened to him. Word had come to the farm, where he'd been, that British troops were scouring the countryside, arresting all men, rebel or no. Fearful of what might happen if soldiers arrived at the farm, and not wishing to make difficulties for his friends, he started for home as soon as night descended. Somewhere north of town he came upon a British patrol. Not stopping lest he be taken prisoner, he bolted. That's when he was shot. "'I don't think the ball struck bone,' he said in a low, strained voice. Each passing moment he seemed to weaken. Mother turned to me. "'Sophia, you need to get Dr. Dastuge.' The doctor lived farther down along Broadway. Even as I heard my mother speak, I, recollecting the crier's call, "'All citizens shall remain in their homes on pain of severe punishment,' was too fearful to move. "'Sophia, it's urgent. You just went out for water, and it will be dawn soon. You must go now. No, wait.' She hurried to where we had been sleeping. When she returned, the red ribbon was in her hand. After placing my cape about my shoulders, she pinned the red ribbon to the collar. "'Shall I take the candle? It will only draw attention. Now quickly,' she said, "'and be watchful.' Opening the door, she all but shoved me out. 